this is a group that actually said openly in 2020 that we need to have a great reset of capitalism and COVID is the perfect opportunity that they can collapse all the current systems, particularly in the developed world, Europe, the United States, then they can build back better slash have a great reset. Build back better is just another word for let's demolish the current system and let's build back in this green climate friendly way. And the Green New Deal basically is a domestic copy of the UN's Agenda 21 and now Agenda 2030. This is the idea that the United Nations came up with and, and the progressive left, that the earth can't be left with capitalism. Essentially, that capitalism and, and climate and, and environment are incompatible. It's uh, going to affect your thermostat, economics, socialization. I mean, so every aspect of your life is going to be managed in order to benefit planet Earth. It's not about the climate or energy. This is a change the whole economy thing. back everyone. When the Green New Deal was first announced, a lot of people laughed at it. But the Biden administration is now running different parts of the Green New Deal through other programs. And here to talk with us about this and why it matters is Mark Morano. He's the author of the new book. It's Green Fraud, Why the Green New Deal is Even Worse Than You Think. And Mark, real pleasure having you on Crossroads. Thank you. Happy to be here today. Appreciate it. And so let's talk first of all about what the Green New Deal was. What did this actually present? Well, it's a good question. The Green New Deal actually predates uh, AOC, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, by several decades. Uh, the first mentions of the Green New Deal, and I go into the origins, was about mid-2000, yeah, the 2000s, about 2005, 2007. Many different authors claim credit, New York Times columnist Michael Schellenberger, environmentalist who's now apologized for the climate scare, says he was one of the original architects. But I think the ultimate origin there's two origins of the real Green New Deal, which is the 1960s progressive movement, which seized upon overpopulation as their ticket to achieve the left's vision of centrally planned co collectivism in America. And that's where, if you go back, every solution to overpopulation, global cooling, all the previous environmental scares all sound like the Green New Deal. And of course, uh, more recently, the 1992 UN Earth Summit, the Rio, uh, Earth, the Rio, Rio Earth Summit, had what was called sustainable development passed. And of course, this treaty was ratified by the United States Senate during Bill Clinton's uh, first year in office. It was signed by a Republican president, the Rio Earth Treaty. Treaty, and that is what essentially laid the groundwork for that. And the Green New Deal basically is a domestic copy of the UN's Agenda 21 and now Agenda 2030. Hmm. And, and tell us about what this is exactly. A lot of people would think it's just environmental sure. policies. You're saying it ties to Agenda 21 and 2030. What, what are these? What's actually in it? Well, this is the idea that the United Nations came up with and, and the progressive left, that the earth can't be left with capitalism. Essentially, that capitalism and, and climate and, and environment are incompatible. Therefore, you need a host of centrally planned bureaucrats empowered, not just in environmental and climate decisions, but in every aspect of your life, to the size of your home, to what uh, appliances you use, to what cars you drive. And I go through the book, there's a, there's a talk about abolishing private car ownership and the obviously the internal combustion engine, having a roving fleet of electric cars, in the words of one one Democrat presidential candidate, uh, and it affects what you eat. Uh, agriculture, you're not, not eating meat. They're pushing now these, you know, vegetable burger, oil processed burgers. They're pushing insect eating. It affects how you travel. We're now being told uh, under a climate emergency, you can't travel unless it's morally justifiable. It's uh, going to affect uh, your thermostat, economics, uh, socialization. I mean, so every aspect of your life is going to be managed in order to benefit planet Earth. And that's the simplest, and I think broadest as well, definition of sustainable Agenda 21, Agenda 2030, UN's agenda. And that's just basically what the Green New Deal, that's why people, many people were shocked. What does the Green New Deal have to you know, do with whether you want to, if you don't have to work, if you don't want to, why is ca farting cows in here? You know, why do they want to tear down buildings and build green ones? It, it was all because this is not a, in the architect, the words of the architects, the Green New Deal, not a, it's not about the climate or energy. This is a change the whole economy thing. And it's also a change 
all the human lives, because that's what the UN even says. We need a complete, a radical, tra centralized transformation of every aspect of our lives. These are, the, these are the words of the former UN climate chief. So the Green New Deal is just the latest in a long line going back to like the mid-1960s when it comes to climate and the environment now, when, plants. When the, when the Green New Deal was first announced, uh, a lot of conservatives kind of laughed at it. If I remember, you know, they, they joked about the farting cow part you mentioned yes. and things yes. like that kind of became the front runners of the whole image of the Green New Deal. And it was really pretty bashed pretty heavily. Um, but now you're talking about it being implemented through different ways. How is this Green New Deal being implemented? Because I know Biden in his own policies said that, you know, they're not using it. People criticized of using parts of it. How is it being implemented? It's a great question. It, it got such negative press that they even had to pull press releases, talking points. Initially, it was introduced uh, in 2019 by uh, AOC and Senator Markey and a few other co-sponsors. But it was definitely an embarrassment to the Democrats. However, every single Democratic candidate paid fealty to it, including Joe Biden. They all had their own versions of the Green New Deal, although at one point Biden didn't even want to call it the Green New Deal because of the negative press. But at some point in the process, Joe Biden made peace with the progressive environmental left of the Democratic Party and ended up allowing people like the Sunshine Movement, which is the youth climate activist movement, AOC, Bernie Sanders, and other climate activists to write his climate plan for his administration. And we are now in the midst of seeing a version of the Green New Deal implemented. And there's two aspects to this, is what they're doing quietly, if you will, behind the scenes, not labeled. And there's still going to be a coming Green New Deal that's going to be introduced in both houses. And of course, Democrats control both houses. And it's going to be a huge legislative battle. And that'll, of course, come down to people like Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia and whether it happens. But in terms of the way Biden's implementing it now, not with the name Green New Deal, first of all, it's all the executive orders that he's done, including against the Keystone Pipeline, including against drilling, including starting to go after fracking by death of a thousand cuts. But even weirder, I would say, or even less conventional, is he's going every agency of the Biden administration, from interior to State Department to defense, is going to be a, quote, climate agency, unquote. In other words, every agency's first and foremost, they're going to be thinking about climate change and implementing policies. So you have the State Department, I'm sorry, you have the, Na the, the Defense Department trying to claim with John Kerry, uh, others claiming that it's a national security threat and that we must essentially tax and regulate and shut down big aspects of our energy in order to save us from future wars, in order to alter the climate. So they are going after this in a multitude of ways, but the Green New Deal itself is still coming in with with that name. It's just they're waiting, and I guess, until Biden gets settled in. Now, I know there's two sides to this. A lot of people on the left, they, they do think that this is a catastrophe coming, and they think that yes. radical, radical action is justified in order to deal with it. On the conservative side, I know that people are more concerned about whether the, whether the things being put in place can actually even address what they plan on doing with it. I know there's a few different viewpoints on this. For people who think that this is, you know, radical change is necessary, what would you tell them and what what are the actual radical changes that they would implement through this? Well, there's two things there. If we actually faced a climate crisis, a climate emergency, which is what they're now claiming, and we only had 10 years in order to act or the planet would face certain doom as AOC, John Kerry, Prince Charles and et cetera say, we would want to do exactly the opposite of what the Green New Deal the Biden administration is doing. In other words, if we actually faced a climate catastrophe and we had to rely on the UN Paris Agreement or the Green New Deal, we would all be doomed. There's no other way to look at it. If we faced a climate crisis because of our you know, energy use and alleged runaway CO2, you know, uh, carbon dioxide, runaway gas and creating an emergency, we would want to unleash the private sector. We would want to unleash technology and innovation. And this is exactly what we had been doing uh, during the Trump administration, where the United States was leading the world. We were blowing the pants off every signatory in Europe of the UN Paris Agreement, leading the world in carbon dioxide reductions. Why? Because of our technological advancement. We were switching from coal to natural gas through fracking, and our emissions were dropping dramatically. At the same time, our air quality was improving and has continued continued to improve since 1970. So the model for if you did face a climate catastrophe is the opposite of what they're proposing for the Green New Deal. 
But you asked me what the most radical things would be. The most radical things would be literally a a uh, regulation on every aspect of your life. And the simplest way to compare this, and I actually have a whole two, almost two chapters in the book on this, the COVID climate connection. If you think that lockdowns and government regulating whether you can have a backyard bar of COVID, whether you can have a backyard barbecue, or whether you can, you know, have a wedding with X number of people, or whether your neighbors can snitch on you, or whether you should lose your, you know, turn your utilities off, your water and gas and electric, if you have too many people and you're, you know, and swimming in your pool in the backyard. If you think that that is nothing but that is a a basically a taste of what is to come under a permanent climate lockdown. Now, the COVID lockdowns ostensibly are supposed to be temporary until the viral emergency pandemic ends. But a climate emergency is going to be endless with no definition, and it's going to impact your travel, your diet, your cars, the size of your home, your thermostat, your uh, your wallet with huge energy increases. And as I said, even, even doing basic things are going to be questioned. You're not going to be able to get in your car, drive to the store. What's your carbon budget? There are people proposing CO2 budgets for every man, woman, and child on the planet where the government would monitor your energy usage. And if you're too high, you have to pay extra or get restricted. If you're too low, you get credits and bonuses, and maybe even you could trade them. I mean, this is a, a totalitarian vision of bureaucratic control of our life for the greater good of preventing the climate emergency. Very similar to the COVID lockdowns. Again, COVID lockdowns ostensibly temporary climate lockdowns are going to be permanent new way of life if they get their way. And I, I found it interesting, too, that actually some people on kind of the far left are opposed to it. Uh, Michael Moore, yes. for example, and one of the founders of Greenpeace, I don't know what his political alignment is, but, you know, an environmentalist, quite a few serious environmentalists I know are opposed to it. I'm, I'm curious if you know what the grounds of their arguments are and whether you, I'm curious whether you agree with them or not. Yeah, well, actually, I have a whole chapter in the book about the, the, the left's opposition to the Green New Deal. And actually, just recently, uh, former Clinton advisor Naomi Wolf came out and basically said that she thinks that the Green New Deal is a form of fascism and she's worried about climate change and a climate emergency, but this is not the way to go about it. In the, in the book, I detail even NASA's former lead global warming scientist, James Hansen, a man who was arrested about half a dozen times protesting global warming. Uh, he was so concerned about it, calls the Green New Deal, you know, basically re totally rejects the Green New Deal calls it a joke. I go through, we have a whole chat section on Michael Moore and his attack on and his revelation on green energy and for his troubles of exposing the folly of the unreliables solar and wind. He got essentially uh, exiled from the planet of the progressives. He was banned on YouTube. He had an effort by a former UN scientist, Michael Mann, by Josh Fox and people in Hollywood to ban anyone showing Michael Moore's film. And people renounced him. Progressives renounced Michael Moore for the heresy of qu questioning one aspect of the entire green agenda. Remember, Michael Moore is a progressive. Michael Moore believes in the climate emergency. Michael Moore loves the United Nations climate process. Michael Moore believes that we're facing planetary doom. Michael Moore wants population control, but he doesn't, he, he, he bails out on the green energy. And just for his one sin of one aspect of their agenda, he was booted. So I go into the great detail on that. But even people like Nancy Pelosi and Dianne Feinstein, uh, senator from California, I show how, because it, Pelosi called it the green dream, Na uh, Dianne Feinstein isn't really into the Green New Deal at all. She just thinks it's, you know, almost a joke. So for her trouble, she has been attacked by youth climate activists sitting in on her office, going to her home. And I go through great detail to show how, given the new paradigm of the climate politics, Nancy Pelosi and Dianne Feinstein are now being presented to Democratic base as the new form of climate denier. And this is what, you know, in their words, climate denier, this is what's shocking about it is how shifted you're either all in on this agenda and have no criticism like Michael Moore dared do, or you're not a part of this and, and they will drum you out. I know in your book you mentioned that the, some of these policies have already been implemented in Europe. You mentioned they already kind of had yes. their own new Green Deal in, near, in Europe. Uh, a lot of us, I've never heard many details on this. I, I guess, first off, um, how was this implemented in Europe? What form does it take and what has the impact of this been? 
Well, Europe has been way ahead, as the, as, the, as the progressives like to say, Europe is way ahead of the United States. Yes, they are. They have a much higher cost of energy. They have much lower economic growth due to this. And they have actual rolling blackouts and shortages, which we're starting to see at any place that relies too much on so-called green energy. California, Texas recently comes to mind. Texas obviously being complicated because it had to do with grid preparedness, including fossil fuels. But What's happened in Europe is the UK, and I detail this in the book, the UK power chief has come out and told residents in Britain that they will have to get used to power only when it's available. In other words, rolling blackouts uh, t certain times during the day or week when there's no energy is going to be the new norm in order to fight the climate emergency. And Europe has gone wholesale actually calling it European Green New Deal. They're, they don't, they don't doesn't have as much of a negative connotation there. So they're going full in. I detail the disaster that's happened in places like Germany and Spain, all the promises of green jobs. Everything the Green New Deal promises has essentially been a Petri dish tried out in Europe, and I present the results in the book, and it's not pretty, and we're already seeing it happen here in places, particularly California, in the United States, where the cost of energy is going through the roof. And oddly enough, the more it fails, the more the green energy mandates fail, the more they want to increase them. And that's what's incredible. The more the plans fail, the more the planners plan. And I just want to make a caveat here, because this isn't about being against solar and wind. It's about saying, if an energy, why ban an energy that's proven itself work, fossil fuels, oil, coal, gas, which has been one of the greatest liberators of mankind in the history of our planet. We've had longer life expectancy, lower infant mortality, higher economic growth, a cleaned up environment as after you get through an industrialization period, much cleaned up environment. You can actually have species protection, you can protect trees, you don't have to do slash and burn agriculture. Why ban that energy which is proven to mandate, and that's the problem, the Green New Deal mandates energy that's not yet ready for prime time. I'm not against particularly solar because solar has technological advancements that could happen down the road, five, 10, 20, 30 years. They always say it's just around the corner, but it could happen and it may make sense someday. We don't know, but we don't wanna ban the other energy and mandate that energy. I say in the book, if you, the day you can go to Walmart and buy a solar panel, put it on your roof, get off the grid, is the day we don't have to have a silly debate about the Green New Deal. Now, you mentioned a few things in your book. You, you describe the Green New Deal as kind of a, a watermelon, right? Green on the outside, red on yes. the inside. And you talk also about the kind of policies to expand the government. And you also mentioned something interesting, which is you talk about the nature of what it means to regulate the environment. And I think all these kind of tie to different elements of expanding government power and what the real motives are. I, I guess, could you explain this to us? I mean, how does this expand the government? And what does it mean when an expanded government can regulate the environment? What does it mean for the average person? Well, what it means is humans inhale oxygen. We exhale CO2. So CO2 is going to be declared, has been declared a pollutant. Actually, the Supreme Court allowed the EPA to regulate what humans exhale from our own mouth as pollutant. It's pollutant. So right there, America, I don't even know our population. is a little over 300 million, I believe, right now, if that's accurate. Um, we are 300 plus million walking pollution machines, according to government regulators. Now, Again, I hate to bring up COVID again, or you know, if I bring it up too much, let me know. But it's very similar to that virus. In other words, the government, when bureaucrats get a mission, all they care about is the virus. So they don't care about collateral damage. They don't care that studies have shown that for every de life a lockdown can save in a virus, you know, 29 can be dead, according to South African actuaries. You know, the mental health, the addiction, the, the failed screen. So all that doesn't matter. All they care about is the virus. The same exact thing will apply when you're worried only about the climate or the environment broadly. All you're going to do are regulations that theoretically protect the environment at what cost to humans and at what end result. Because I argue in the book, and I have case, in cases, if you look at some of the most regulated societies, including the old Eastern Bloc of the Soviet Union, Eastern Bloc countries in Europe, they had the worst environments and they were the most highly regulated. And people immediate response, well, it wasn't done correctly. Well, you know, then where has it been done correctly? Where it's been done correctly is in the United States with free markets, technology, innovation. Because once you get rid of that and they start controlling every aspect of your life in order to fight a climate, there's no 
end game. In other words, there's no criteria where it's like, okay, once we've achieved this, we'll let off and we'll go. You know, at least in COVID, they have this nebulous concept of cases, which depends on a lot of different factors in cycles or hospitalizations. But in climate, what are they going to do? Everything now is a climate measure. It's not just you know, first of all, polar bears have disappeared. They've disappeared from Al Gore's books and movies because the numbers are at or near record highs. According, and I and actually include the latest data from 2020, available data from 2020 that show that they're through the roof. But everything now, if everything is caused by climate change, then every indicator is climate change. In other words, they can now say racism is caused by climate change, which they do. And this, I have a whole chapter on identity politics. So if racism is up in your area, that means climate is getting worse. That means we need more climate regulations. And that's what I'm saying. There's no, once you go down this rabbit hole, there's one end, and I have that in the book, and it's literally, it's totalitarianism, it's a 1984 vision, and people would have thought, oh, that's, an, that's, that's a little bit out there. But after a year of COVID, COVID lockdowns, mandates, and seeing the way the World Health Organization has conducted itself and the CDC, I think people are a lot more open to seeing how a climate lockdown would mirror what George Orwell warned us about in 1984, the, the novel. Now, I, w I want to go a bit more into what you talked about with this whole build back better, the kind of system it's creating. Yes. But first of all, I talked about this identity politics thing because this seems yeah. far fetched. I mean, how, what does identity politics have to do with the environment and the Green New Deal? And what does it actually say about this? Well, the gist of it is that white colonial slave-owning founders of America came, and America was central, of course, and, and started the Industrial Revolution, which required mining and coal extraction and building up our industries and cities. And this was essentially created by a white power-based country. This is what the, the, the argument goes. And who has suffered because of this? Obviously, you know, they say we needed slaves in order to power this, uh, this economy initially, and then we had segregation, and then the blacks got the raw end of the deal. And essentially, this is the legacy of slavery, which is created by our fossil fuel use. And this isn't just, oh, some activists at, you know, Harvard University saying it. I quote, current leading NASA climate scientists who are peddling this kind of philosophy. And, and even Al Gore has picked it up now. The climate is due to white supremacy. And I go back to the 19th century. This is not a new idea. In, in the 19th century, the Aborigine uh, indigenous people in Australia blamed the change of the weather on the, on the appearance of the white man on the continent. So when whites appeared in Australia, the local indigenous people blamed it the change in weather on the white faces. And that's documented in the book. I then show that if you go through the whole history of this movement uh, of the climate identity, it's all part of this package. The idea is the reason identity politics is involved in this is because it's not really about the climate and environment. They're throwing in every progressive idea into the mix in order so that they can have, uh, you know, their, their, uh, a change the whole economy, change the whole society kind of uh, vision and, and plan. And that's what they're going for. That's why they've strayed so far from climate and environment. Now, let's talk about this whole Build Back Better idea. This is one of the things yes. Biden's talking about. We, you know, we've also heard about other programs like it, of course. Um, what do these actually entail? How do they plan to build back from this virus, and how is this related to the uh, climate okay. agenda? Well, this, is a, this is a huge part of the book, especially toward the end. It, it gets into something called the Great Reset. The World Economic Forum, which is in Davos, founded by Klaus Schwab, uh, includes everyone from Bill Gates and Prince Charles and the uh, Al Gore and John Kerry attends every year, world leaders. Um, this is a group that has ap actually said openly in 2020 that we need to have a great reset of capitalism and COVID is the perfect opportunity. In the words of uh, Hollywood actress Jane Fonda, COVID is God's gift to the left. Why is that? Because if they can, and this, because if they can collapse the current economic systems around the world, which are, you know, yeah, I'm not going to say they're capitalist necessarily, but they're more free market oriented and they've been growing more, you know, less capitalist over the decades. So it's not a classic capitalism, but if they can collapse all the current systems, particularly in the developed, developed world, Europe, the United States, then they can build back better slash have a great reset. In other words, they're not upset when they see that 2020 saw the largest transfer of wealth from the poor and middle class to billionaires, to the wealthy. We, we have everything from Facebook, 
Walmart, uh, 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 Amazon, incredible, just go through the roof in terms of their value. And they're the ones pushing hardest for the lockdown. Same way politicians, government health bureaucrats who want endless lockdowns and COVID, their salaries haven't been affected, but they're crushing particularly mom and pop small businesses. And why is that? Because mom and pop small businesses are the least ones likely to go after a great reset agenda, World Economic Forum, and Build Back Better. Build Back Better is Joe Biden's word for great reset. The idea is everything's collapsed. We're going to start from zero and then we're going to build it back up. It's a demolition job. They're demo demolishing, they're demolishing the current structure and they're going to build it back better or just leave maybe a parts of the foundation and a couple walls standing, but they're going to build it back in their green image. And we actually have politicians openly saying this. John Kerry said the great reset will happen faster than you ever imagined. The UK House of Lords uh, common speaker actually said he was amazed at how compliant the public was with the COVID lockdowns, and he's very excited about moving immediately into a version of a climate lockdown. And these are the actual phrases they're using, and they talk about restrictions on air travel, on car travel, restrictions on economic restrictions, all in the name of the climate. So build back better is just another word for let's demolish the current system and let's build back in this green climate friendly way. And I quote in the book an author from Canada, Naomi Klein, who says, you know, that capitalism and climate are incompatible with a living planet. And so that's the goal, that's the activist base, and these are the ones now in charge, meaning John Kerry is all in on this. John Kerry is, is the climate envoy who's gonna be traveling around the world promoting this Build Back Better slash Great Reset vision. Now you also mentioned technocracy, and there's, there's a bit of a, yeah. A funny, funny relationship here because you have big businesses pushing for this. At the same time, you have socialists pushing for this and people talking about destroying the capitalist systems. How does that jive with the tech technocrats, the guys who want to use big business with this? Well, it's interesting because you have the, the CEO of Walmart is all in on the Great Reset because they love it. You know, this it's and China has a lot to do with this as well. China, has, it's unbelievable the influence they have. They bought out the Harvard uh, School of Medicine at Harvard University. They bought out the World Health Organization. They have heavy influence in the United States. They have heavy influence with key politicians in the United States. So what ends up happening, you see like the WHO doing an investigation into the origins of the Wuhan vi of the, you know, the virus coming from Wuhan, China, and you're finding you know, the end investigations going endless. China has veto power about what they find. I mean, so that's a part of it, but ultimately, the sort of the left wing progressive activists and the big corporate America are part of the same you know, bandwidth on this issue. Why is that? You have people like CBS Ticketron recently announced that they're going to have concerts and you'll only be able to attend a concert from you know, buy a ticket to a concert if you have a vaccine passport. And I'm, I don't think it's a far stretch. You're already seeing the European Union do this. We're already seeing countries like Israel uh, start to have this. In other words, you have to get a, a passport for immunity. Well, mom and pop small restaurants, small businesses are very less, much less likely to ever go along with that. Whereas corporate America all sings from the same hymn book. They're terrified of being anti-woke. They go along with everything immediately on, on all of these progressive issues. They cave immediately. So part of it is you collapse the small business. And then you get a controlled corporate class by the progressive activists. So in a way, to answer your question simply, the, the progressive left has no problem with big business anymore. Why? Because they control the puppet strings. They have every major corporation in America, from Bank of America to Walmart um, to every CEO, eating at their beck and call on every issue from transgenderism to, um, to identity politics, you name it, any wish list of the left, they got it. They have cancel culture going in full swing, said something when you were a teenager, you're out. So that's why they're no longer at odds. Big business, corporate America is controlled and terrified of and under the reign of terror, if you will, of the woke left. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on as well with meat, and they're, of course, pushing this new Beyond yes. Meat. And, you know, if we, were, if we read the Green New Deal, it did have a lot talking about criticizing cattle and wanting to ban cattle, meat, yes. it seemed. And this was kind of taken as a joke. A lot of people thought it was a joke. Um, it's not a joke. <laughs> are, they, are they looking to ban meat? How, how does this whole thing work? What are they working on? They absolutely with? are, and it's a climate issue. Uh, the former UN chief, Cristina Figueres, act climate chief, actually said that we need to treat meat eaters the way we treat smokers in restaurants, have their own section, put them outside, put them out back, slowly start to ban them. Uh, we have 
Al Gore, who, who, who got involved in this, he's invested in his, uh, his big IPO, was one of the biggest in the world. He's trying to be the world's first fake meat billionaire because of his efforts in this. The United Nations issued a huge report basically saying that cattle, agriculture, incompatible with the climate, we need to stop this. So what's happening is they're now talking about all these processed vegetable meats, forcing it upon us, more and more regulations, the World Economic Forum, it's part of the Great Reset. They also say, you know, you'll own nothing, you'll be happy. And people have been promoting this. Um, Bill Gates went out and promoted, he drank water made of feces. Now it's in the developing world. He's trying to turn, you know, contaminated water into better water. But their, it's a, the technology, their vision of the future is you can turn anything. And there's actually been talk of poop burgers, burgers made of, of different sort of feces and anything you want to make them out of. Some people said that was a joke. It's unclear given the, everything, everything that they're trying to do here. But ultimately, there's going to be a war on meat eating. The first thing you're going to do is scarcity, prices going up, and then the fake meat alternatives, which, by the way, even CNN nutritionists said these fake vegetable meat, which sometimes processed with 20 or more ingredients, which goes against the organic, pure vision of the earth, the idea of having the unprocessed food. But because it's not meat, people are willing to chow down this, these burgers. They said it's nutritionally nowhere near as good as a lean meat burger or a turkey burger or a fish burger. It just made no sense nutritionally scientifically, but it makes sense ideologically. And they're also pushing insect eating. Uh, the World Economic Forum, part of the Great Reset, is to start putting insect eating. They're talking about sort of frappéed, blended things where you won't know what they are, a paste you can put in a lot of stuff. It's apparently good on protein. You have Hollywood actresses, people like Nicole Kidman doing videos eating live bugs. Uh, you have other climate activists talking about the beauty of eating bugs and how, you know, this. what I never understood is how come the animal rights activists aren't upset at the Hollywood left or others eating live bugs. Yeah, where are these insect rights? But this is what they're doing. This is what they're pushing. And again, I don't, this isn't in the book. It's not the author, me, Mark Morano speaking. I, this is uh, almost a hundred pages of footnotes. I use their own words, their own quotes, their own citations. I present to you the case. What I try to do very little in this book is as have what my opinion is or what my beliefs are. Uh, I do put some analysis in, you know, there's a lot of analysis, but, but I actually, over and over, I let you see what they're saying. And the, again, I just want to emphasize, these are not, you know, some teen activists obscure somewhere. These are some of the mainstream people, big Hollywood stars, big organizations, United Nations, pushing the insects, pushing no more meat eating. So this is a definitely a big part of it. What they're worried about is cows burping and the other end putting out methane emissions and, uh, you know, causing excess warming. But I actually have uh, scientists in there and peer-reviewed studies showing that that concern doesn't even hold up scientifically in peer-reviewed literature. Hmm. Just last question here. I mean, you, pa you paint a pretty concerning picture. A lot of people say, well, Time to just roll over and die, I guess. You know, like <laughs> what 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 do you what do you tell people? What do they do about it? What can be done? Well, I like to say, and in the book I mentioned, the Berlin Wall was not torn down because the East German Parliament voted to uh, take the wall down. It, it came down because the people of East Germany no longer gave their consent. So in the book, I'm actually critical of the Trump administration for causing this, and I think that I have the solution at the same time. Until we challenge the narratives. In other words, the reason the left has been so successful, particularly what I mentioned earlier, how they control corporate America, corporate boards, corporate CEOs, and how they just roll over, is because they come at them with one little issue at a time and they embarrass them and they tell them that they're anti-science or that they're racist or that they're you know, anti-woman, whatever the issue at the time is, and they make them cave. Until we challenge the entire narrative of things like a lockdown for COVID, same with a lockdown for climate, until we challenge the, the idea that there's a climate crisis or a climate emergency, I have a whole chapter going after the science. And when I mentioned the Trump administration, the problem was the Trump administration had a unique opportunity for the first time since 1988 when the UN climate panel formed. We had an opportunity to have a U.S. Uh, government climate commission headed by several dozen prominent climate skeptics. One was considered the foremost expert on the greenhouse gases. Uh, Dr. Will Happer of Princeton would have led it. And one was a former Obama federal scientist, Obama Biden federal scientist, Steve Coonan, who was going to be involved in it. It was approved by the Trump, by Trump himself. The staff nixed it because they didn't want to deal with a challenge to climate science. But without the challenge to the premise 
we are hurting because we're always just fighting the result. In other words, it's it's understood even by most Republican politicians now that you can't challenge climate science. In the United States Senate, there's no committee left where even a skeptical scientist could go testify against the claims of the United Nations or Al Gore. So what I think we need to do is go back and challenge the premise. And I make an argument in the book and I show peer-reviewed studies. I go through all the weather events. I go through the geologic history of the earth. I show you scientists who voted for Al Gore, who believe Al Gore uh, is a smart man, but were horrified when they saw his science presentation. These are the head of the Ivy League, you know, University of Pennsylvania. I feature Robert Giegenkeck. I go through former United Nations scientists who turned against it. So until we challenge the narrative, we're in for it. And the problem is, because of COVID, we're doubly in for it because they can just sort of morph from COVID lockdowns to climate lockdowns. And that's the scariest part of the book, scariest part of what we're seeing happening. I, I actually have all the comparisons of uh, whether it's on transportation, freedom of movement, Etc. that the uh, climate activists want to model the climate emergency measures after the COVID lockdowns. In fact, I have a whole section, a whole chapter virtually on people, pr climate activists from John Kerry to Al Gore to the United Nations to politicians to, to academia, all saying they love the climate lockdowns and they were basically jealous that they that the COVID got these lockdowns, but not climate. We need a climate lockdown just like the COVID lockdown. So the way to fight back is challenge the narrative don't give consent and get Republicans to actually grow a spine, which is probably the hardest of everything I just said, because it's unlikely any current crop. Very few Republicans. President Trump himself was great, but his administration, when it came to challenging the narrative, just just took a pass. No one in his administration, other than his first EPA administrator, who was dr drummed out of town, Scott Pruitt, uh, was the only one who challenged the climate claims of the United Nations. Hey, Mark Morano. So again, uh, his book, just for our audience, it's green fraud, why the Green New Deal is even worse than you think. And Mark, it's a real pleasure having you on again. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs>